Good morning and welcome to Harrisburg Baptist Church. Um, something I, I know this morning to be true is that God wants to speak to somebody here today. And something we believe is that we have a very real enemy. And it is the goal and the plan of that enemy to seek, to kill, and destroy the work of God in your life. And he will distract us, and he will uh, work in, in any way that he can to keep us from seeing all that God wants to do in our life come to pass. So here's, I want to just encourage you as we begin this morning to, to just lean in and to believe with me that, that God wants to speak to you in this place um, today. If we haven't met, my name is David, and I lead our student ministry here, and I'm so thankful for so many of you who sacrificed your Saturday and got out in some warm weather and, and helped our students move in yesterday. Uh, we're so excited to have them back in our community and excited to be a part of what God's doing there on campus at Campbellsville Harrodsburg, and uh, I'm excited about what this semester has in store for us. If you have a copy of the scripture, uh, we're going to Acts chapter 2 this morning. If you've been with us the last couple of weeks, it's probably a, a pretty well worn passage for you. Uh, we've been in this first two chapters of Acts here for, for now our fourth week, and, and it's not because we've gotten stuck, but because there's just a lot going on that we're seeing and experiencing a lot. A quick uh, catch you up, a refresher on the book of Acts is it's a history of the church that, that, that God uh, sent his son in Jesus who lived and, and he died and was buried and rose again. And he had these apostles that followed him around and these people that watched his story unfold. And then he ascended and it was their turn. And Likewise, it is our turn that the church of Jesus Christ is now this vessel that God is using to take his good news to the world. And we've watched in, in Acts chapter 1 and 2, and, and we've been instructed and, and, and we've been uh, challenged to see that, that our goal as a church should always be to be an evangelistic church, to be a church that is preaching the good news of Jesus in our homes, in our community, in our state, in our country, and across the world. That should be our heart. We, we saw that this move of God in Acts chapter 2, these crazy, uh, amazing, miraculous things that are happening would not have happened without prayer. That prayer is at the heart, that the intentional, fervent prayer is necessary to experience a move of God. Last week, Pastor Jonathan challenged us to be people that are tellers of the story. The story of what Jesus has done in us, that we would be constantly uh, uh, sharing Jesus with the world around us. We're going to wrap up this series this morning, and, and I really believe that, that God is working in our church, that God is doing something in our, our midst, in this gathering, in this community. And, and I just want to encourage you once again, lean in, lean into the Word of God, not because I've got something really special to say, but, but because I'm believing that God's going to speak to you this morning. Acts chapter 2, we're going to be in verse 42. Uh, we're going to try and put the verses up here on the screen. If you don't have a copy of you with this scripture, give us a, a, some patience this morning. We really appreciate it. Our team up there is doing a great job uh, fixing some stuff that I'm not smart enough to figure out. I walked up there and I was like, I don't know, turn it off, turn it back on, pull the cartridge out. <laughs> I don't know. I, that's all I got for you. So, <laughs> Acts chapter 2, verse 42 says this, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers, and awe came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. They were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Let's pray. Jesus, you're so good. We could go home right now and, and man, I, I feel that we would be full of things to worship you for, things to celebrate, things to be encouraged by. But God, we believe here you have more, that you have something for the heart and life of each and every person in this room. And God, I pray that you would clear our minds of distractions, and, and help us to focus our attention in on your word, that we are ready to hear from you, expecting to be changed and motivated, moved and challenged by you. God, I ask that you would use me, that you would empty me of myself, and that you would fill me with your spirit, that you forgive me of my sin and lead me 
as I lead your people in your word for your glory. Be with us now, Holy Spirit, fall like rain. We love you. Thank you for everything that you allow us to do and help us to praise you in every of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. You ever, some of our college students here, you know, starting school, I think on Wednesday, and uh, I, I think maybe you, you might have had an experience like this. Um, you, you ever had to do a group project? You ever had to do a group project? Here's what you should know if you've never done a group project and you might do a group project soon. There's three types of people in a group project. There's the person who, when the group project is assigned, they're kind of the take charge person, right? They're going to set up the times we're going to study and meet. They're like, this is what we're going to do it on. I'll start the group text. I'll organize the stuff. This is what's going on. This, some of you are smiling because that's you. Uh, you're that person, right? And then there's another type of person in, in, a, a, group, uh, in a, a group project that is the favorite kind of person of the get it done, take charge kind of person. And that's the person that says... I'll do whatever you need, right? Like, you tell me when to be there, I'll bring snacks, I'll set up the board, I'll, you know, line up the slides, I'll, I'll do the things uh, to get it done. Uh, you just tell me what needs to be done. And then there's the third type of person in a group project, and that's the does nothing, but still receives the grade of the other people person in the group project. I don't want to impress you too much this morning, but uh, when I was in college at the University of South Alabama, I was studying sport management, and I actually, uh, once again, you don't have to treat me any different, I, I got to do a, a group project with someone who is, is now uh, a, a pro bowler in the NFL. His name is Jeremy Reeves. He played at the University of South Alabama, and he now plays for uh, the Washington Commanders. But, but me, me and him and several others did a group project together, and it was on Gatorade, and it was a marketing presentation, and I don't remember how we did. I do remember that he worked really hard, and I was impressed because it was spring, and he was getting ready for the draft, and I was really impressed that he would be there and, and show up and, and be a part of, uh, of, of really, you know, helping with that project. But once again, you don't have to treat me any different, you know, you don't need to kiss a ring or anything like that. Just, I'm the same guy. But, you know, I was thinking about this kind of dynamic and this concept, and my first thought uh, came to a, a guy named Tyrese Halliburton. Uh, I think we have a picture of him. Maybe. Potentially. Oh, there's Tyrese. Tyrese Halliburton is a, a, a player in the NBA. He's a, a point guard for the Indiana Pacers, and he's really good at basketball, like really really, really good at basketball. He was a, a, an all-star last year. He averaged 20 points and led the league with over 10 assists. Um, he, he was hurt during the middle of the year. Mason and I were actually at that game when, when, he, was, when he hurt his hamstring, but um, we didn't have anything to do with it. We were just in the stands. Um, and uh, he still was, you know, nominated or, or selected to be the third uh, on the All-NBA third team. This is a really, really good basketball player. This guy's great. One of the best shooters in the league and, and, and really good. And, and Tyrese Halliburton, as you can see, was on the U.S. Olympic team uh, this summer. And, of course, they, they won gold, and, and he was on that team. But, but really, during his time in, in Olympic play, Tyrese Halliburton in the whole uh, uh, six-game uh, pool play and into tournament play and championship, Tyrese Halliburton only took three shots. That, that this is a guy who's used to being the star of his team and, and was part of an Eastern Conference Finals team that lost to the Boston Celtics in four games, and then the Boston Celtics went on to win an NBA championship, in case you forgot. And then, but he's an important part of this team, and he goes to the Olympics, and he's at the bench. That he... Contributed maybe in practice. I think he played eight minutes in one game, five in another. Took three shots, went one for three. But what's really interesting is that the reward was shared with Tyrese Halliburton, that he was still a gold medalist. You know, there wasn't a separate line for the bench guys and the starters, but still received a gold medal so much so that he tweeted uh, this after the Olympics. He said... When you ain't do nothing on a group project, but still get an A, gold medal emoji, right? So he still gets to keep the gold. This morning, we're looking at the book of Acts, and the title of this message, if you're taking notes, is Sharing the Rewards. That we're looking at the foundation of the church. We're looking at the very beginning of what we are now a part of 2,000 years later. This is ground zero of the Christian faith. 
And we've watched in these first two chapters of Acts a short amount of time, Christianity has gone from a few followers of a risen Messiah standing with their eyes pointed towards the sky and their jaws drop to an exploding movement of thousands mobilized to take this good news across the globe. We've seen, and if you continue to read the book of Acts, you're going to see some pretty incredible stuff, some pretty crazy Stuff, some stuff that we don't see. What's interesting to me is that at the beginning of the church, we see very clearly that there is power in the church. But if I could be so bold to say that somewhere between Acts chapter 2 and 2024, churches have lost that. That we're not living in this way. That we're not sharing the rewards as they were. The average churchgoer in America attends 0.8 times a month. I'd argue to say that for some of them it's lack or never experiencing the power. Mercer County, Kentucky, 87% of our neighbors don't identify as having a church home. Where's the power? Where are the rewards? More than one third of American adults report to feel report of feeling lonely and isolated. That wasn't going on here. Political strife, even within the church, is at an all-time high. Hate for our neighbors, social unrest. And I, I just want to challenge us to believe this morning that the church of Jesus Christ has never been more needed than it is needed in this moment, in this hour, in this season. What's really beautiful to believe and to see and to understand is that you and I, followers of Jesus, we are the church. And the church is God's method of delivery for his work in the world. That's, that's us. We have a part in this. That we, we look around the world and we see a lot of brokenness and we look around and see a lot of hurt and we see addiction and we see sorrow and we see broken families and we see people who are struggling. And we are the solution. That through the power of Jesus Christ and and the power of his Holy Spirit, we have been called into this mission. And I just want us to understand this morning, if the church doesn't look like Acts chapter 2, it's not God's fault. If our gatherings don't reflect what we read here in Scripture, it's not because the Holy Spirit stopped working at some mysterious time. But this morning, I believe that if we would do as these have done, in devotion to the Spirit of God, living in the presence and the power of God, we too, in 2024, in Harrodsburg, Kentucky, could experience this. That we too could share in these rewards. Quickly, I want to give you this morning the Acts chapter 2 plan for exponential, explosive church growth. I want to give you a little insider knowledge into how a church, this church, any church can grow in a wonderful, beautiful, powerful, unbelievable, unexplainable way. I want to teach you how a church can see miracles and experience unity and have authentic community and connection to one another and how we can, yes, have more people than we would ever know what to do with. If we believe these words, believe in God's power and his spirit, it's simply us understanding what God is calling us to do. A couple of things that we need to share as we share in the rewards. Is first, I see here that they shared and we should share in our devotion to the word. Share in our devotion to the word. Uh, Acts chapter 2, verse 42. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Now, you may have never read this passage before. That's okay. And you may wonder, well, what were the apostles, what were these people teaching? What were they talking about? And flip back just a, a page in my Bible here to Acts chapter 2, and you'll hear Peter, who was one of these apostles, and he was teaching, and, and really he was teaching two things. One, he was teaching the Scripture, and he was teaching about Jesus. That here in, in Acts chapter 2, he quotes the prophet Joel, he quotes from the Psalms, and, and all of it is to point to his experience with Jesus. He's, he's preaching the Word, and he's preaching Jesus. 
If you go to uh, Acts chapter 3, you'll see in a second that Peter is given another opportunity after he heals a dude to, to, to tell people what, what power he healed people in or he healed this guy in. And you'll see here that Peter, once again, he preaches Jesus. He, he, he's sharing about Jesus, that his focus is on the Word. If you fast forward to 1 Peter uh, chapter 1, verse 3 through 9, and Peter's writing a letter to the early church, and in this letter, he once again preaches one name, one message, one truth, and that is Jesus. You see, this morning, uh, we have to, to understand that, that we only have one thing to preach. We only have one meth message at this church. It's the Word of God fulfilled in Jesus Christ. That, that is what we have to offer. That is all we know to preach. Here we believe in God's Word. We believe that it's inspired by the Spirit of God, that it's good for correction and reproof and wisdom. And it's one message from Genesis to Revelation. All this is about is one thing, and it's Jesus. See, so we have to unite our hearts and share in our devotion to the Word. If we want to experience an Acts chapter 2 kind of church, if we want to see miracles and we want to see people selling what they have to provide for others and give to one another, our hearts and our lives have to be centered around Jesus, around the Word of God, around the truth of God's Word. This is why I want to encourage you when, when you come to church, lean into the message. I, I know I said it pretty explicitly or clearly this morning, but, but man, I, it's, it's not because I'm standing up here or, or even Pastor Jonathan's standing up here or, or anybody's standing up here that you should listen. I, I mean, I, I've got some, some half-decent sports takes, and uh, I'm, other than that, I really don't know what else I've got to say that's worth hearing. Those probably aren't, but I mean, God's Word is worth hearing, that, that God's Spirit is speaking through it. And we believe that when we gather, we should lean in because God wants to speak to you through his word. So I want to encourage you and take notes and, and remember and, and discuss as your, as your family leaves this place and, 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 and encourage one another with the message because I believe that, that through God's word, we too can be changed, can be challenged. You know, it's funny. Jonathan, I bet you'll share in this. I think we've talked about this. Sometimes when I'm writing a message, I kind of, kind of start feeling myself, you know what I mean? Like, I'm like, ooh, that's good, okay, <laughs> all right. People, I'm going to tell this story right here, and I'm going to say this right after it, and people are going to come up to me, and they'll be like, man, that changed my life. That was the moment, that was the best thing anybody's ever said. And I'll say it in, in a message, and, and I'll say it, the thing, and I'll go, hey, you know, I'll say it, and then everybody will go, okay. <laughs> but so often it's the, the things in my messages that I didn't plan to say or the things that maybe I was nervous to say, or things that maybe even seemed a little uncomfortable, those are the things, or things I don't even remember that, that people will come up to me and say, man, you said this, and, and that was exactly what I needed to hear. And the truth is not that what I was excited about was, was not worth saying. It's probably that I needed to hear it and you didn't, but that's the power of God's Word, is that it speaks to all of us, and that it has instruction for all of us, and that it applies to all of us. Do we want an Acts chapter 2 kind of church? Do we want to see a place where people's needs are met, where there's authentic community, where there's real connection? Man, the Word of God has to take priority in our lives. We have to value it. We have to apply it. We have to live it. Second, I see here that we, as they did, need to share in our encouragement or our love for one another. We need to share in our love for one another, Acts 2.42, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer, continuing on in Acts 2.44, now all the believers were together and held all things in common. They sold their possessions and property and, distri and uh, distributed the proceeds to all as they had any, any had need. Excuse me. Every day they devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple and broke bread from house to house. They ate their food with joyful and sincere, sincere hearts. This was voluntary. They wanted to get together. They wanted to be in each other's presence. They wanted to experience community. They wanted to, to find connection. And I'll give you a, just a little bit of insider knowledge that, that, that maybe you don't know. Uh, there's you know, publications and things that publish information for churches, probably like they do if you work a job for your industry too, you know, kind of the insider stuff. And, and studies upon studies upon studies have, have shown that people stay in church for one of two reasons. And it's not how great the pastor is. 
It's not how great the worship band is or what kind of music they sing or what their building looks like. The thing that really keeps people engaged in church for a long period of time is one of two, if not both things, and it's that they are connected to a group of people that they identify as sharing in life with them or that they find that they are empowered to, to give and use their gifts to serve others within the context of that, that organization. That for us, what we would call discipleship groups and our serve teams are the things that will predictably say that you will be still engaged in church in years to come. That those are the things that, that, that are true indicators or factors of that. And here in the early church, we see a ton of this going on. I mean, it's, it's all over the place. They, they, they're serving each other. They're getting together. They're feeding each other. They're, they're selling their stuff off to make sure people's needs are met. They're doing this and doing that. Man, they're getting, they can't wait to get together and worship. They're going to go to the temple every day. Then we're going to go to John's house. Then we're going to go to Rick's house. Man, we're going to do all this. We're going to be together. That's going on all over the place in Acts chapter 2. But yet we let fear hold us back from experiencing the church fully. Man, what if, what if, what if people don't like me in that group? Man, what, what if I go to sign up to serve somewhere and some kid snots on me or worse, put some other bodily fluid all over me, or I, I've got to, you know, pill, you know, clean up a drink that some middle schooler spilled, or I've got to, I've got to, you know, carry some stuff for some college. Do we let fear hold us back? I just want to encourage us this morning, church, that Jesus will bless and multiply only what we give him. You may be familiar, there's a story Jesus, it's actually recorded in all four of the Gospels. Jesus, and I'm sorry if I'm stepping on what you've been reading. Jonathan's been reading a book about this. There's a story of Jesus, and he's got these 5,000 men, which some people think was at least as many as twelve to 15,000. Some people estimate as many as 35,000 people. This is like a big group of folk. And Jesus is sitting there, he's preaching to them, and they have a problem because they're hungry as people get, and there's not a Costco anywhere near. And so they're like, how are we going to feed all these people? And Jesus is like, well, what do you have? And they find a little boy who's got five loaves of bread and, and two fishes. And Jesus takes it and he blesses it and he multiplies. And he feeds this multitude. And what's beautiful is that there's 12 baskets left over, that there's more than enough when we give what we have to Jesus. But I'm not here to preach that this morning. I'm just here to challenge us to ask, are we holding on to what we have? We're saying, no, you can't have my time, God. You, you can't have my kids, God. You can't have my talents, God. You can't do this. I, I, want, I need, that's mine. Or do we give it to him and trust him to bless it, multiply it, and use it? This week, I, uh, I won't tell you who it was. I won't call, a, call them out. But I, I caught one of our, our senior adults. They were serving our church. <laughs> Uh, in a se kind of secretive way that there was a spot on our property where some branches had grown up over, a, 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 over something and, and they just stopped in the middle of the day and I didn't actually plan to go over there that day but just happened to be kind of headed that way and, and saw them and stopped and they had brought their, their, their uh, shears or clippers from home and were just trimming back that, those weeds. Weren't asked to do it. Would not want me to tell you who it was because they don't want you to go shake their hand afterwards and tell them how great they are but they did it because they... They love our church, that they love the work of God in this place, and, and they want to support it however they can. They, they say, I, 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 don't, I don't care if it's, if it's my job. I don't care if I'm going to get paid for it. I don't care if it's what I'm supposed to do. I just see a need, and so I fill it. And I believe here in Acts chapter 2, you see a lot of, I see a need, so I'll fill it. I'll step in. I'll step up. I'll do what's needed because the work of God is important. I want to encourage you, get in, get connected, share in each other's burdens and sorrows and joys, find a community here, be a part of a church. And, and here's the truth, we've got some college students here, hey, we love you and we'd love to have you be part of our church, but if you come here and you say, hey, this is not really my cup of tea, that's okay, we know other great churches in this county, well, we'd love to encourage you to find one of those. We want to encourage people and get, be a part of, of the work of God, be a part of the church of God, be a part of what God is doing, whether it's here or somewhere, get in and be a part of it because it's there that we experience this these rewards, that we share in them fully and truly. I'm almost done, but I see here quickly that they're sharing in their focus, and we should share in our focus of prayer. 
Acts 2, 42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. And I'm not here to preach the same message that I did two weeks ago. If you're really interested, you're probably not, but you can go watch it on YouTube and you can listen to it on two times speed and you'll get through it a lot faster. But I'm not here to, to preach that message again, but what I, I really see here about their prayer is that it's consistent and continual. It's not they showed up and they prayed for each other and then they went home, but that their, their life is, is rooted in prayer. That they pray, as Paul said, without ceasing about everything. And, 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 and really that, that the goal of a life of prayer is not just to pray to God, but to live a life in communion, dwelling with God, to know God and experience him. Yes, on Sunday and in our gathering, but also on Monday at our work and our schools and also when we go to practice and also uh, when we drive the, the kids around and also when we spend time with our family and also when we go out to, to hang out with our friends, when, also when we go through hard times, also when we walk through dark moments, also in every season that we'd be people marked by prayer, known by prayer. Can I just ask us boldly and asking myself this? When's the last time someone outside of this room asked if you would pray for them? Are we a church where people may not know what our pastor's name is or may not know what our website is, or what kind of song we might sing on a Sunday morning or what to wear, but they know that's a church where people pray? If we asked our community, hey, if you need to get prayer for something, where would you show up? I believe that, that man, uh, we, we should set a goal to say, hey, if people were asked that, they would say, oh, I'm going to go to that church right there. That's a church where they pray for people, where they pray for stuff. Consistent, continual, intentional prayer. The Acts 2 model for church growth is these things. To, to experience God and share in devotion to his word, to share in our encouragement and love for one another, to share in our focus on prayer, but also, lastly, to share in our heart for worship. Acts 2, 47. Praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. See, the early church didn't see worship as a box. They checked on Sunday morning. They saw it as a life they lived 24-7, 365. And I just want to remind us this morning that your job is worship when it's done to honor Jesus. And your marriage is worship when its purpose is to honor Jesus. Jesus. And parenting is worship when you're pointing your kids towards Jesus. And singing is worship when our song is about Jesus. And using our gifts and talents is worship when it's done to honor Jesus. That anything and everything is worship when our heart is pointed towards God. But I believe that often we're too self-reliant and self-dependent to think that we should even take time to praise God. That we, we rely on our income and we rely on our family status and we rely on our, our history and we rely on the things that we've done, our work ethic. And so we don't think God is worthy of the praise of the things in our lives because we truly think that we did it ourselves. But here in Acts chapter 2, the church that was experiencing this power and, and, and this uh, uh, incredible move of God was one where they saw everything as they did, uh, that they did as being worthy of worshiping God in it because they knew that it wasn't them. See, they had experienced Jesus. So many of them had seen Jesus and, of course, the very founders of this church walked with him every day and watched him and knew that he had been crucified, brutally murdered, lynched. They watched the blood drain from his body. They knew the stories of crucifixion and how horrible it was. But they had experienced him not just in his death or his life, but they had experienced his resurrection and I just want you to know that this morning when you experience the resurrection of Jesus, you can't help but live differently. You can't help but, but walk and talk differently that things in you will change. And this church here in Acts 2 and the church that I desire and pray that we will become is one where people have authentically encountered Jesus. That we share in these things and, of course, ultimately... Sharing the rewards. Not because of something we done, man. We're just sitting on the bench. That's, that's the truth. 
uh, our pastors, our leaders, our, our, our discipleship group leaders, uh, none of us are doing this. We can't build this church. We're just sitting the bench and watching God work, watching his spirit lead, watching God move. And I just want to say that as we, we finish this series here in the book of Acts, it's been some heavy messages, some hard truths. And I, I'm thankful that we are a community of people that we've got tough enough skin that we can hear some things that are going to challenge us, that we can hear some things that are going to spur us on to love and good works, as it says in the book of Romans. But I, I just, for me, I can't speak for you. I'm tired of playing church. I, I don't want a cultural Christianity. I, I don't want to be a part of a church for social status. I, I don't want to do this uh, uh, or, or be a part of this so that people will think that I'm a good person. I, I don't want to do it so we can just be okay and check the box because this is what we've always done. I want an Acts 2 kind of church. I want to see people healed in Jesus' name. I want to see families restored in Jesus' name. I want to make heaven crowded. I want to see our, our city shaken. And I believe this morning that God is faithful to do his part. And that the Spirit of God, who is present in this moment, is the same one that raised Jesus from the dead. And it's alive in me. It's alive in you if you're a follower of Jesus. I want this. I want, I want this. But we have to consider what is our response. Will we share in the rewards? What is our heart for worship? Will we share in the rewards? What is our focus or a priority of prayer? Will we share in the reward of, of a church like this? How are we loving and encouraging one another? We share the reward. What is our devotion to God's word and the work of Jesus? We're going to go into a, a moment of response. Our team's going to come and, and lead here in a second. I just want to encourage you. You're welcome to, to come and pray. The Holy Spirit of God convicted you or talked to you some, some way through his word this morning. Uh, don't let that just sit. Respond. Do, do what that prompting is, to, to pray, to, to respond, to journal, to, 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 to do whatever uh, it, it is that, that you're called to respond to do. But, but don't just go into a moment where we sing and, and stand as quick as you can and start singing so that we can ignore the things in our lives that we may need to address. You're welcome to stand and sing in response, and I hope that you do. That's a, a wonderful way to respond. But, but I, I just really want us to consider these last four weeks and ask ourselves truly, Do we want this kind of church? It's scary. It's going to be scary. It won't be easy. But the rewards will be worth it. Let's pray. Father, you're so good. And we thank you that your spirit is faithful to speak to us. We thank you that in the midst of technological I don't know, confusion and in the midst of, of all that's going on in our lives, you're faithful to show up and speak. Father, I pray that we would be this kind of church, an Acts 2 kind of church, that we would watch you move and speak and work in ways like Mercer County has never seen and like the state of Kentucky has never seen, like our country has never seen, like the world has never seen. We believe in, and we've got faith to see you do the impossible in our lives, and so we ask that you would do that, but also that you would see our hearts, that you would know us. She would see the wicked ways within us, and that you'd correct those, that you'd challenge us and help us to grow. This morning, I want to encourage you to respond, but if you're in this room and watching online maybe, and, and you've never made a decision to follow Jesus, the greatest reward you could ever receive in this life or in the next is to know that 2,000 years ago, God sent his son his name is Jesus. Historians, atheists, or Christian, all alike will agree on his existence. That he lived. 
While he was alive, he did some pretty incredible stuff, fed 5,000 or more people, that he walked on water. But his purpose in coming was not just to do miracles, but he came to die. He was taken, that he was beaten, that he was hung on a cross for you and for me. And as he did that, the sins of the world were placed upon him. That the wrath of God was poured out. And that today you stand before God with the gift of salvation in your grasp. It's very simple. To become a follower of Jesus is acknowledging that we've all sinned, I've sinned, all of our team, and all of us, we're imperfect people, that we've fallen short of God's glory, which just means no matter how hard we try or strive or even on our very most best wonderful day, we still are sinners. But Jesus paid the price that you couldn't pay to reconnect you with God forever that you could have what Jesus promised to give us, abundant life on earth and eternal life in heaven. And if you've never made a decision to give your heart and your life to Jesus, it's so simple. It's just giving up. It's just saying, I don't want to go my way. I don't want to do my thing. I don't want to lead myself. But Jesus, I want to give my life to you because you're worthy. We watched the testimony of a young lady who did it this morning, followed his example in baptism. It's, it's so simple and it's so life-changing. I just want to encourage you, if you've never done that, would you have just a little courage? We go into this time of response. Pastor Jonathan's going to be in the front of the room. I'm going to be in the back. Would you come find one of us? Maybe a discipleship group leader that you know in this room. You say, David, I've been coming to church here for 40 years. Or maybe it's your first day. I, I, don't, I don't care. I, I just want you to know Jesus. There's no judgment in this place. I promise you, you'll, you'll look around at a room full of people celebrating what God has done. But would you have the courage to respond? If you want to pray for our church or encouragement or if you need prayer for something in your life, I want to encourage you to find your way to this altar or me in the back of the room. People would love to pray for you and encourage you and challenge you and, and help you. If you want to stand and respond and worship, that's great. However it is, I trust God in your life, but respond how the Spirit leads. God, you're so good. We love you. Thank you for the work of your church for thousands of years now. I pray that you would continue it on, that you would fan the flame, and that revival would pour out in our city. We need you. We need the power of your spirit and your presence. You're so good. We lift you up. We love you. Thank you for everything you allow us to do and help us to praise you in every of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.